Well, good morning, church. Thank you, little Johnny. That was awesome. Appreciate it. I've known John since he was 15. Did y'all know that? And uh, just love him. Erica, Jennifer, thank you for leading us today. Wasn't that a great song we just sang? Just told the whole gospel story. Just amazing how uh, intentionally Dan and the creative team with Nancy crafted this moment for you to be right now in this moment as we talk about perhaps one of the most serious subjects of this whole series, and that is spiritual warfare. Do you know Satan does not want you to succeed? Did you know that? Do you know why he hates you? Because God loves you. That's why he hates you. And the number one thing Satan wants you to do is to take your life because you were created to live all for Jesus and if Satan can convince you to take your life that he is one. And I think it's time the church started telling the truth about mental illness and struggles with uh, depression and suicide. Don't you? Yes. That's several of you. That's good. Uh, in my podcast, I address those things and I encourage you to go out and listen to the Scott Weatherford Leadership Podcast. I think you might find some things insightful. But this morning, I want to talk to you about evil and the presence of evil and what does that mean and what does that do? So I have some questions for you. So go ahead and take out your notes and jot some things down and we're going to go on this adventure together. Uh, is there evil in the world? Does evil exist? That's the first question I want to ask. And of course, y'all are saying, duh, duh, we see it uh, all the time. We hear it propagated on our news media. We see it manifest in in, in the world. Now, here's some things. Evidence mounts at the level of human atrocities that evil is alive and well and present in the world. Now, evil is manifested because there is a comparison to good. Without good, there is no evil because evil contrast is a contrast to good. Are you with me? And just the psychological profile, the, the, uh, the philosophical profile of what's good and what's evil and what's defined. Evil is on the move, and it's almost everywhere we turn. I just uh, read a report from Burundi, Africa, where uh, they found graves of 400,000 people that were genocide in the recent revolts of Burundi. Y'all didn't know that, did you? Because evil has gone unreported. And it's the same two tribes, the Tutu and the, the Hutis and the, tu, the Tutus in Rwanda, Rwanda that uh, committed genocide back in 94. But what's happening in Rwanda, because of the influence of a local church in North America, that whole country has now turned and is following Christ. And that, that whole country's been transformed. I was in Rwanda four years ago, and it's amazing how there's a transformation because the gospel defeats evil. Is evil a personal thing? A, a person, a spirit, a demon? What is evil? Is it a personification? Well, that's a real debate. And you say, well, evil is a spirit. Evil is a, evil is a, a movement. E but evil is, 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 is a person. The personification of evil is debated, but the Bible is very clear about the author and the source of evil. And he has a lot of names. Beelzebub is one of those names. That means Lord of the Flies. Y'all probably had to read that in junior high, didn't you? Yeah, Beelzebub, uh, Satan, the old slewfoot. Uh, the wicked one, the deceiver, the liar, the accuser of the brethren. He's got lots of names. And this is what Peter said about Satan. Stay alert. Watch out for your enemy, your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He roams around like a pro looking for someone to devour. Well, what do I do about evil? What, what is my response to evil? Well, I know some of you are saying what I'm going to say at the end of this talk, which you know where I'm going with this, but we're going to talk to you about it for about 35, 40 minutes before we get there. I might as well just say it and drop the mic and walk off, right? But I can't do that because I did all this study. What do I do about evil? The natural response is to run. The natural response is to hide. The natural response to evil is to sit in this building sing our songs, and pray Jesus comes back. But we are not natural. We are supernatural. So our natural response needs to be drawn up into the supernatural. When you see a lion, you're most likely to run, but some choose to run 
toward the lion. There was also Benaniah, the son of Jehoadiah, a violent warrior from Kedzbel, Kedzel, and he did many heroic things, which included killing a two of Moab's champions. Another time, on a snowy day, he chased a lion into a pit and killed it. 2 Samuel 23, 20. What causes a man to chase a lion into a pit on a snowy day and kill it? Because he has a king that's the king of the lions. I read that to my dad several years ago, and my dad said, well, I guess that old lion needed to be killed. And that's what a warrior does. It chases lions. I journaled this morning about you, praying for you, and I prayed it a positive prayer and a hopeful prayer, asking God to give me wisdom. And I said this, and I don't mean this to be um, adversarial or, or sliding you in, the, in the, 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 any, any way. I just love you. I said, Lord, it seems to me for 135 years, this church has chosen to attend and to be comfortable. How can you use me to change them into lion chasers? to see them become a movement for the glory of God that shakes the whole of the earth from a a place, an insignificant out of the way, a place called Wimberley. What can you do, King Jesus, for us? And oftentimes when I say things like that, your mind goes to foreign lands when our mind needs to go for the shadow economy here in Wimberley where crystal meth is on the rise and marijuana is used continually to numb pain and poverty abounds among us in the middle of our great wealth and prosperity. Chase the lion. God never intends for us to shrink back. He wants us to be aggressive in love and stand against evil. Well, how can I and how, how can I and how can we respond to evil? That's a great question. This morning, I'm gonna be addressing that in this next to last message in our series on Ephesians. God wants us to live in victory. That's what he desires. He doesn't want us to live in fear. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. He wants us to be aggressive. That happens when we discover how to stand firm in the Lord. God never enters into the debate about the existence of evil. He knows all about evil. In fact, evil lived in his presence until he was punted out of heaven. And we know evil because we know good and God is good and God is good all the time and all the time God is good. So let's go on this adventure in God's word. Here in the book of Ephesians, Paul teaches us how to stand our ground and how to chase lions. Now I wanna say this about Satan. He is a lion. He's a toothless lion. His teeth were extracted on Calvary. All he can do is gum you and get spit bit all over you. He can't hurt you. Well, that might have been a little gross, but I hope it, you, that's the only thing you'll remember. <laughs> so today, let's go on this adventure. All right, y'all ready? Father, thank you for what you're going to say to us, and I pray that you speak through me this morning. That will not be my words or thoughts, but Father, your truth that just kind of breaks through in this very, very important subject that we're talking about today. And I thank you for how good you are how you take insignificant, ordinary people, you fill them with your spirit, you use them for your glory, and we become the hope of the world. Be with this church, Father. Awaken this church to its full redemptive potential. Awaken me, Father, to my full redemptive potential. And I pray this in your son's strong name. Amen. If you have a Bible, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. We'll start in verse 10, and we'll make our way down through it. Uh, In our group time this week, we're going to be talking about prayer and the intentionality and the process of prayer. And I want to say this to you, okay? So I want you to hang on. Uh, Lent starts Wednesday. Y'all going, what? This is a Baptist church. We don't do Lent. That's right, we don't, but hang on. There's some things that are pretty daggum good, you know? And taking 40 days to focus on Jesus is pretty good, wouldn't you think? So what I want to challenge you starting Wednesday is to take 40 days and focus on Jesus. Now we are releasing this week, we'll be on our, on our social media, on our, our webpage and other pages, Facebook and other things. We're going to launch this out. 
is our study we did on 52 weeks with Jesus. Mike, is finally happening. And we're gonna launch that this week. Now, we've designed it for you to take a week with Jesus for a year. But if you wanna do it as a Lenten study, 40 days, you could watch 40 videos of what Jesus had to say about different things for every day during this season. I think it'll motivate your heart. It'll help you live all for him. And I'll encourage you to do that. Tara and I are doing a study together. She has a book uh, for women. I have a book for men. And uh, it's, it's from a company called She Reads Truth. Right, Tara? And it's uh, the book of Jeremiah. We're gonna walk through that together. I'm excited about that. I cannot wait to preach to my wife every day. <laughs> and we'll see if she gives an offering at the end of it, y'all. But uh, take this, seize this moment to be intentional. Seize this moment to be intentional. And many things that other, other denominations or belief systems teach us, Christian belief systems, not worldly, but Christian, teach us we have a tendency in our Baptist arrogance to, to, dis, to dissuade them or devalue them. Some of them are really good and we ought to seize them. Are you with me on that? Because we are biblicists first. We're Baptist second. Are you, did y'all hear me on that? Now, some of your heads are hurting right now, and I'll move on to spiritual warfare. Here's the first thing I want you to see out of Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Paul says this, a final word. Now, I love the fact that Paul says a final word that he talks on and on for a while. He's a good preacher. A final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Be strong in what? The Lord, not your self-sufficiency, not your self-righteousness, not your intellect, not your power to debate, but in the Lord, in his mighty power. Put on God's armor so you'll be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil, all the strategies of the devil. Now, Pop, Paul is right, wrapping up this letter, and what he's done, he, and I'm gonna trace this back for you so you'll understand, Verses, uh, excuse me, chapters one through three, he talks about the great theology, how God loves us. Chapter four, he says, now this is how you live. And he turns his attention to self uh, analyzation. You look at yourself, be self-aware. Then he says, now be aware of a culture. Then he says, be aware of your family. Now he's saying, now you need to be aware of the devil. And then he talks about prayer at the end of this. And then next week, uh, I've already written this talk because I have to go to Dallas this week. I'm not looking forward to it. I found out about it uh, this, this past week that our church is being recognized as one of the top five baptizing churches in Texas. And we're gonna be recognized as a, at a convention this week that I had no intentions of attending. But since we're gonna be recognized, I need to show up and go, hi, y'all. So, Y'all pray for me while I go to Dallas. Will you do that? And the crying over here is exactly how I feel, all right? <laughs> but we'll go and we'll endure that. But Paul is wrapping up this and getting very practical. And the first thing he says is this, be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. Now, I wrote this, and I want you to seize this, and this might be a great thing for you to tweet out or put on your Facebook or whatever. Christ within you is stronger than Christ beside you. Let Christ rule and reign in your heart. We don't want to have a relationship with Jesus where we're merely friends. We want to have a relationship with Jesus where he abides within. And that abiding within through the presence of the Holy Spirit gives us authority and power to stand, to live. It's really imputed power and imputed righteousness. God gives us it to us. Be strong, God's active power that it's not for a defensive that we may stand firm, hunker down, and hold on, but we could be offensive. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And what we was talking about was literally the storming of a castle or a fortified city. Taking the aggression and tearing down the gates, destroying the walls, setting captives free. I will build my church and the fortresses of hell cannot stand against the onslaught of my movement, which will tear down the darkness. Wow. And I have to be strong in the Lord, in his power, in his armor. The warrior is clothed in the armor of the king. You're clothed in the armor of the king. Who's king? King Jesus. Now, let me take you back in time. Y'all ready to go back there? We're gonna go way back. We're gonna go back to Saul and David. 
Now, you remember David, the, the, the skinny arm shepherd boy who showed up at the battle line after he'd been anointed king. This is what happened. Samuel looked at all the Jesse's sons, and one by one, they stood before him, and, and there was a king there, and he says, don't you have another son? He said, yeah, we got David. He's out in the shepherd field. He said, go get David. David came, and Samuel says, that's the man right there. Not because of his statue, not because of his physical prowess, but because of his heart. His heart has been prepared for such a time as this. And then Samuel anointed David king. And the Bible says this. From that day forward, the spirit of the Lord dwelt within David. Saul come, David goes to, to see the army, to see his brothers facing the armies of the Philistines. And there the giant Goliath wanders out onto the to the battlefield and he taunts the armies of Israel. Everyone's scared. But David says, I'll take him. Let's go. I'll take him. Why did David do that? Because the spirit of the Lord rested on him from that day forward. Saul hears David and he says, Brave, come here, let me put my armor on you. And David says this, I don't need the armor of you, O King Saul, because I have the army, uh, I have the armor of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And you have the arm, the armor of King Jesus as a believer. And that armor is not some Kevlar vest. It's actually his righteousness that's given to you. Listen to what he says. Put it on intentionally because we have an active scheming adversary. Let me tell you what the Satan loves to do. It's what he loves to do. He loves to cause disunity. The first place of disunity he'll cause is in your mind. He'll make you question God and his righteousness, to impugn God and his righteousness. He said, God loves everybody but you, you're a loser. That's what he loves to say to you. Everybody else's sins could be forgiven, but not yours. You're bound for a devil's hell. In fact, you will never amount to anything. Satan loves to call disunity in your mind. And then he loves to call disunity in your family. If he can't get to your mind, he'll get to you and your wife or your husband or your children. Satan is a dead gum punk. He picks on our kids. And he picks on them all their lives because he hates you and he hates them. And then he'll cause disunity in the church and division in the church and we'll become divided over things that don't matter, like the color of the carpets and the color of the pews or whether or not we have pews. He'll get us divided over somebody sat in my pew. That just sounds disgusting right there, doesn't it? <laughs> and we get di di divided over stuff that doesn't matter does the pastor have his shirt tucked in or tucked out? Is that shirt some kind of psychedelic drug that if I stare at it long enough, a lion's gonna pop out at you? <laughs> hmm. He loves to cause doubt and discouragement. To make you doubt, to get you discouraged, he loves to make you disillusioned. Like when you start believing this is as good as it gets and you're discouraged. Debauchery, that's behavior that's fueled by discouragement. You begin to act out. Depravity, that's the slide past debauchery. And then finally, and I couldn't think of another D word, but I thought of one, despair. Let me give them to you again. Disunity, division, doubt, discouragement, disillusionment, debauchery, depravity, and despair. Did y'all get that? That's what Satan loves to do. But here's the five nastiest demons of the church today. I don't want to name them for you, okay? This is Satan's buddies, the five nastiest demons in the church today. The first one's arrogance. When you start believing you're better than everyone, and many of us suffer from what is called spiritual narcissism. Have y'all been keeping up with the uh, political stuff in the world today? I want to tell you something. God's not a Republican. He's not a Democrat. God is not a capitalist. God's not a socialist. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. Did you know that? He's not in heaven wringing his hands. Oh, my, what are they going to do? He's not doing that. He's not doing that. But as I watch, and I want to say this to you, you need to vote. I'm not going to tell you how to vote. You need to vote. Exercise your civic duty. Vote. 
because we live in a nation where actually our votes matter, unlike many, many places in the world. But as I listened to the debates this week and I listened to other things, we have an unbelievable air of arrogance in our country. And we suffer from political narcissism. And we suffer that in the church entitlement. Entitlement means I want what I want when I want it. And you know if you're entitled when you don't get your way, how you react. When you had to park too far out or sit too close up. Hmm. It's interesting to me how you want to park close but sit back. <laughs> What's up with that? <laughs> Elitism. When you feel like you're better than somebody, which leads to racism, and elitism and racism will lead to genocide. Did you know that? And then judgmentalism. I'm here to judge you. <laughs> I was on jury duty. I was called for jury duty not too long ago. And uh, we were in this room. There's like 200 people in there. And they, they, I've, never, I've never served jury duty before, so I don't know how it works. But they kept everybody in there, and they set us in positions where they could call us by name and question us individually. Have y'all ever experienced that? Where they, they question you, and so I'm hiding. You know, I'm, I'm, I did not wear this shirt, okay? <laughs> I was hiding, behind, I got behind this big guy and I was hiding, I was kind of hunkered down, I was keeping my mouth shut because I did not want to be on this jury. I did not, I did not have time. I, well, I was gonna do my civic duty, I showed up and I was sitting there, and then the defense attorney, he looks, he said, oh, juror number 77, Pastor Scott Weatherford. <laughs> Pastor Weatherford, do you believe you might have a hard time casting the first stone? <laughs> That's what he asked me. And I said, so, well, you know, I'm here doing my civic duty. You know, we have to hear evidence. And obviously, I don't want to incarcerate somebody who's innocent, but, you, you know, people are innocent until proven guilty, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, well, Pastor Scott, uh, you're a pastor here. Um, wouldn't you have a hard time not judging people? And this is what I thought. This was the internal conversation. I'm a Baptist preacher. I judge people all the time, especially this girl with the pink hair <laughs> right here beside me. I'm judging her. And I'm judging him with the neck tattoo. I'm judging him. And I'm judging, I'm judging, I'm judging, I'm judging because I'm broken. Not to say that out loud. Probably should have. I got kicked out of the room. That'd be great. <laughs> I did get dismissed from the jury uh, because I knew the prosecuting attorney. She'd been at our house about 10 times, not in her official capacity. She's friends with our daughter, okay? But man, judgmentalism, have you ever walked in a room and been judged? Have you ever judged anybody when you walked in a room? And I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand if you did that today. And it's the devil's tool. It's the devil's tool to make us think we're better than somebody else. And Jesus said, judge not, judge not, lest you be judged by the same standard by which you judge. And that ought to scare us all to death. You see, we're in a spiritual battle. For we're not fighting with flesh and blood enemies, but against rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against unseen powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places, Ephesians 10, 12. This implies, y'all, we're not fighting against, this implies, this Greek word implies hand-to-hand -hand combat. This means up close and personal combat. I heard a pastor, he, he said this uh, not long ago, I loved it. He said, you know, for us as Christians, we have the ground game, we have the ground war, and we have the air war. Air war is prayer, ground war is engagement. We need to pray before we go in to engage. And our military does the same way. They call softening the target by their air war. I had a good friend of mine who was a two-star general over the air war in Syria. And many a morning he would call me and say, Pastor, pray, we're sending boys into harm's way. Because they were softening the enemy. You see, people are not the problem. They're not. But people can be a pawn in the problem's hand if we're not aware. Be aware and don't allow Satan to use you. Can I repeat that? Be aware and don't allow Satan to use you in your family or in this family called the church or in this community. 
Some of you need to get off of Facebook. I don't know who you are. I'm a public figure on Facebook. I don't see your stuff. All I can do is post things and get off. I'm a, I'm a public figure. Let me tell you why I'm a public figure. First of all, I don't need the drama of Facebook. And second of all, I've been hacked three times from Nigerians asking for money. And, and I've just said I can't do this, so I'm a public figure. But some of you need to just stop it. I don't know who you are. It's just a blanket statement. So if you feel guilty, own it. I'm just saying we must constantly guard our hearts. So here's some things I want you to be aware of. Don't allow people to hide behind you. When people say this, uh, people have come to me and said. When people come to you and say stuff, nip it, nip it in the bud, to quote Barney Fife. Are you with me? Really, when people come to me and they say, Pastor, 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 we just love you, Pastor. Usually when they say that, but is coming. But many people have come to me and said, which really translates, I've gone to many people and said. <laughs> huh. Don't allow people to borrow your power. Well, I heard so-and-so say this, and when they said, I heard so-and-so say, they've said it to so-and-so, and so-and-so stood there and looked at them with a blank look, and they walked away, and they borrowed power from you. When someone says something to you in your family, in your extended family, your personal family, in this church family, they say something that's negative, critical, they'll go away from you and said you said it. They will give you credit. You need to say, you know what? You need to stop that. You got a problem with them, go to them. Stop it. Uh, vet everything you hear and, and see. Fake news with a biased perspective will lead you astray in your thinking. And I'm not just talking about what you see on CNN, MSNBC, or Fox, or whatever. Fake news with the perspective of a bias will lead you astray. Vet everything you hear and see. Now, I'm not going to go into the division of demons, even though Paul opens up that, that he talks about powers and principalities and schemes in the unknown world, although evil is very organized. Paul is giving us a quick glance into the unseen world. So just take a deep breath. We're not going to go down there. But there's an order to evil and darkness, and it has an intent. And the intent of evil is to do this, to destroy you, to divide you, and to kill you. That's evil intent. All right, enough of that? Y'all ready for something hopeful? Please? Yeah? Okay, here we go. So dress for success. Dress for success. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you'll be able to stand to resist the enemy at the time, enemy in the time of evil. Then, then I love this. This is this is awesome. Then after the battle, you will be still standing firm. Then after the battle, you will still God said, You go win. You go win. Just stand firm. You go win. You'll be all right. I love what Jesus said to Peter. Peter, he said, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. Satan's asked permission to sift you, each one of you, like wheat. But I've pleaded in prayer, with, in prayer for you that your faith will be firm. And after you repented and returned, strengthen the brothers. Peter, you're going to have a comeback, but you're going to go through some stuff, but you're coming back. And y'all, you're going to go through some stuff, but you're going to win. You're going to win. It's going to look tight. You might have to shoot a three pointer at the buzzer, but you're going to win. God has won the victory for you already. So stand your ground. Stand your ground. Stand your ground dressed like this. Let me read it for you. The belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness for shoes put on peace that comes from the good news that you are fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as a helmet. Take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Every piece. Now, then after the battle, you're going to be there. God wants you confident. God wants you strong. God says, you're going to stand, and I'm going to be there with you while you're standing. I'm going to be there with you while standing. So let's dissect this. What is this? The belt of truth. What does that do? It holds up your britches. You can't fight with your britches around your ankles. 
And truth secures you. That's why truth is important. You hold it around you. What is truth? King Jesus is truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Hunker down your britches with truth. Then put on the body armor of God's righteousness. What is that? God said, God, this is what Jesus has done. When Jesus died on the cross for you, he took his righteousness and he took it off. He says, come here. And he put it on you when you trusted him. That's what he did. It's not your self-righteousness because that's not good body armor. But he took off his righteousness, put it on you. There you go. You have imputed righteousness. You have my righteousness, not righteousness that you created, not righteousness based on your good deeds, not based on what you do, but based on what I have done. You have my righteousness. Now stand firm. You can't touch you because you got my righteousness. Satan can try all he wants to, but you have my righteousness. So he's gonna accuse you. He's gonna remind you of everything you've ever done, but you got my righteousness. You tell him to shut up. You got me. People are going to come and they're going to accuse you and you've got my righteousness. You're going to mess up, but you got my righteousness. I've already forgiven your sins, so live like it. you got my righteousness. Wow. How did I get it? By trusting Christ. That's how I got it. By trusting in Jesus. The shoes of peace. Isaiah said this, how beautiful on the mountain are the feet of those who bring the gospel of peace. Paul said this, quoting Isaiah in Romans 10, 15, and how will they know unless a preacher is sent? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring the gospel of peace. In John MacArthur's commentary, he talks about these shoes of peace, and he said literally, Paul was dressing a Roman soldier, and they wore cleats. When they went to battle, they had cleats on their feet. So when they stood in their line, and this is really interesting, the Romans conquered the world by standing with their shields in their, in their left hand, their swords in their right hand, and then they would have a, another soldier standing behind their shield, and their shield, and their shield, their shield, their shield, their shield. And so they protected each other with the Roman phalanx, the sword in their hand, and the shield here, and it protected their brother, and they went after the enemy like that and they were unmovable. And when the enemy shot the arrows, they dropped to their knees and raised their shield and covered each other. Each other. That shield is not just for you, it's for your brother and your sister. Because we stand best together in the body of Christ. And these shoes that hold us is the shoes of the gospel of peace. How beautiful are the feet. That's why girls, you need to buy some good looking shoes. Now, some of y'all helped me move recently, and y'all saw, saw my collection of shoes. I got some shoes, y'all, and I'm unashamed about my shoes because I got beautiful feet because I'm sharing the gospel of peace. So y- y'all got it? Now, as I get older, I'm looking for comfortable shoes. They might not be pretty to behold, but they're good to wear. The shoes of peace, the shield of faith. The fiery darts of the devil, you hold up that faith. It's not faith in faith. It's not faith in you. It's faith in Jesus. That no weapon formed against me shall stand. You hold the whole world in your hand. I'm holding on to your promises. You are faithful. You are faithful. Did you sing that today? Yes, you did. Did you forget? Obviously, you did. Wow. The God of angels' armies is always by my side. The helmet of salvation. Why would you put on a helmet on your head? Because Satan has a broadsword, a big, sharpened, two edged sword. On one side it says doubt, the other side it says discouragement, and he wants to whack you in the head with that. And when you got the helmet of salvation on, when doubt hits you, it goes ping. And when discouragement hits you, it goes ping. And you'll shake your head and you go, King Jesus is king. You take that sword away from Satan, you whoop him with it. He has no authority over you. And then the sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit, that's an interesting Greek word. There's two words for the Word of God in Scripture. One is logos, and one is rima. Rima 
is the revealed word of God. Now, some people think that it's an extra word of God, but I want to tell you, it's not an extra utterance from God. It's God's word that you've hid in your heart that you may not sin against God. And that the weapon of the sword of the Spirit is the revealed word of God that you've hidden in your heart that you pull out on the day of temptation, the day of defeat. Last week, I had someone come and they prayed with me about something going on in their life, and I gave them a sword. I gave them the sword of Psalm 118, uh, 116, 18. You shall not die but live to declare what God has done. She took that sword and she's gonna fight her battle knowing that she will not die but she will live to declare what God has done. Greater is he that is within you than he that is in the world. Hold on to that sword of truth. I am crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live. Jesus Christ now lives in me. The life I now live is by faith in the Son of God who gave himself for me. Hold on to that sword. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Hold on to that sword. Even though you've passed through the fire or go through the flood, I will be with you. My right arm will sustain you. Hold on to that sword. God's got you. He's got you. When I was in seminary, I took a seven-week class on evangelism taught by Dr. Randall, and Dr. Randall made us memorize 77 passages of Scripture in seven weeks. And we had to write them out in our final. And I am so thankful for him making me do that. Because what he did is he gave me an arsenal. And I can pick up this sword and use it. I can pick up this sword and use it. I can pick up this sword and use it. I can pick up this sword and use it. That's why your time with God and his word is so vitally important to your life. You need three distinct environments every week. You need this gathering with other believers. You need a group of people who hold shields to protect you. And you need your time with King Jesus. You need gathering, group, and God. Are you with me? And when you get those three every week, you will be successful in all that you do. That's why we provide curriculum for you for every one of those environments. Why? We're bored, ain't got nothing to do. It's because we love you. Do, do, do you get that? We're in this together. And then Paul says, the last thing he says is this. He says, Pray, pray. Pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. Not just praying for yourself, but you're praying for all believers. That prayer does not, prayer makes me aware. It doesn't inform God, it makes me aware of God, that I'm gonna pray. Spiritual battles are won in prayer and realize the practice of holiness that I'm going to live out the prayer. prayer. Pray in the spirit. Now, some people take that and they translate that as some kind of metaphysical prayer time or some mystical prayer time, but this is a practical prayer. This is a prayer in the spirit of Jesus, not some kind of crazy mystical thing, but in the spirit of Jesus. In Romans 8, 26, Jesus says this. Paul said this to the church in Rome. You don't know how to pray all you, as you should, but the, Jesus is making intercession for you with groanings too deep for you to understand. I want to pray in that spirit, don't you? In the spirit of Jesus. And pray for each other and pray for me. Pray for me. I need your prayers. So what shall we say about such wonderful things as this? If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? Nobody. Nobody. So stand firm, because ours is the victory through Christ our Lord. Now, we're going to end today with a couple of things. I preached too long, and I apologize, but that's a Canadian apology. I'm not serious, because I think we needed this time. Don't you think you needed, we needed this time? But I want to tell you something. This is the key. Here's the key. You need to surrender. You need to surrender. Surrender to Jesus. You see, when we fight battles in our own power, we will lose. But when we surrender and join the winning side, we are more than conquerors through Christ who loves us. We need to surrender. 
So I'm going to pray for us. Then I'm going to sing an old, old song. And I want you to listen, and I want you to, or if you want to sing, you can sing. But I want you to respond in faith to Christ. Some of you need to surrender to him as Lord. You've never given your life to him. Some of you need to, rescind, to surrender your cares and your worries. Some of you are realizing, I think Satan may have been using me. Surrender. And join the winning side. And then when you live all for Jesus, life works. You're going to win. You've already won through the blood of Jesus. Father, I thank you for what we've heard today from your word. And, and Lord, I pray that, that um, we'll, we'll make decisions today that change us. And Father, I pray for the ones in this room that have never trusted you, that today will be the day of their salvation, that you will change them. And folks, if that's you, if you need to trust in Christ this morning, I want to invite you to pray with me this very simple prayer. Jesus, I'm yours. Jesus, I'm yours. Thank you for dying for me, for forgiving me. I'm going to live for you. Jesus, I'm yours. If you just prayed that with me, then you just surrendered to King Jesus. You've joined the winning side. Can the rest of us pray that, Jesus, I'm yours? I'm not going to fear the battle. I'm not going to fear the storm because the Lord of angels' armies is by my side. Thank you, Father. Thank you. And Father, I pray that this church, this church called First Baptist Church of Wimberley, Texas, will surrender to your lordship and that we will live all for you. And I pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Our prayer team is here. They'd love to pray with you. I'm going to ask that if you, if you can, stand. If you don't need to stand, then sit. Stand while I sing this old song. And if you need to come pray, you come pray. Oh, to Jesus, I surrender. Oh, to him, I freely give. I will ever love and trust him. In his presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. Oh, to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender. To Jesus I surrender humbly at thy feet I bow worldly pleasures all forsaken take me Jesus take me now sing with me I surrender Blessed Savior, I surrender all. Oh, to Jesus I surrender. Make me Savior, holy thine. May thy Holy Spirit fill me. May I know thy power, divine. I surrender, oh, I surrender, oh, oh to thee, my blessed Savior.
to Jesus I surrender, Lord, I give myself to Thee. Fill me with Thy love and power, let Thy blessings fall on me. I surrender. Father, I pray that we will not just sing that, but we will live that off of you, King Jesus. And I pray this in your strong name. Amen. <laughs> 